Okay, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Kim Madden from Advocates for Children. Um, presenting with me today is my colleague, Karen. Um, everyone, my name is Karen Herrera and I'm a parent center advocate here at Advocates for Children of New York. And on the back end is Liliana, uh, if you wanna introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Liliana. You won't be seeing me today, but I'll be in q and I am the director of the Advocates for Children Parent Center. Um, so if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and you'll get me or Karen or perhaps Kim. Thank you. And we're going to have just so that how this works is definitely put in your Q&A. We'll monitor through our, your questions in the Q&A section. We'll monitor it as we go along. We'll also stop a couple times for questions. Um, so sometimes if we see something come in and we know we're going to address it in a little bit, um, we'll get to that. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us in this really uh, wild and exhausting of times. Uh, I don't think last week we had any idea we would be feeling the way we feel right now and, and facing a new increased COVID threat. Um, but uh, today we are going to talk about something that uh, is complicated and I'm sure stressful for all the people joining us who are trying to navigate this for their own families, um, middle school and high school admissions for students with disabilities. Um, so uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are going to do a, a poll. Sorry, let me just do that first. Um, and just so we know who's here. So if you could let us know, we'll give people another minute or so to join. Um, but it helps us to know who's here if you can let us know. Oh, Brooklyn is winning. <laughs> <laughs> and parents, of course. Okay, it looks like someone has a question. If you can put it in the Q&A, that would be great. We are recording this, just so you know, so we will be sharing it afterwards on a Zoom. Uh, I'm sorry, on a YouTube uh, recording. Um, okay, so uh, let's just show people where we're at. It's mostly parents, um, which is great. That's who we're hoping to target because this is the most stressful for parents. Um, and uh, also it looks like pretty equally divided among the boroughs, but Brooklyn did win. <laughs> All right. Um, so take it away, Karen. Okay. So tonight we'll be walking you all through the middle and high school admissions process, specifically for students with disabilities. Uh, but before we begin, we'd like to give you all a brief overview of who we are. Yep. Advocates for Children of New York was founded in 1971 by parents of students with disabilities. AFC is an independent agency and our mission has always been to ensure a high quality education for New York students who face barriers to academic success, focusing on students from low income backgrounds. Some of the services that we provide um, is our helpline. Our helpline is open Monday through Thursday from 10 to 4 p.m. This tends to be the service that most families interact with. If your child is struggling in school or experiencing school discrimination of any kind, our education specialist will assess your problem and provide you with free assistance, ranging from information you can use to advocate successfully on your own um, to assigning an education specialist or attorney to work with you directly. Um, we also provide free legal services to low-income families. If you are seeking representation, you can go through our intake process. Uh, guides and resources are available on our website. Uh, work assumption trainings just like this one, uh, you could request one. And then we also do policy advocacy and impact litigation. Our all, every, every service I just mentioned can be found on our website. If you go to the Get Help tab and scroll, you can find our helpline, the number. If you don't feel comfortable speaking to someone on the phone, you can fill out a form that will be sent to AFC info at advocatesforchildren.org. Um, we also offer a service line, a language service line. So if English isn't your first language, we can find a translator to help assist. Um, guides and resources that are available range in a variety of topics, um, including walking parents through the IEP process to uh, speaking about uh, school discipline, suspensions, et cetera. And if you want to request a workshop or a training for your school or organization, you can click on training and workshops and view our catalog of topics, uh, which include all the topics that we uh, offer. And then our back to school, which will soon to be 2022 updates can be found as well. 
Another great resource is our YouTube channel. So as Kim mentioned before, if you cannot make, make it to our webinar, you can find our recorded webinars on a variety of topics. Right now, for example, we are in our Turning Five series, which is walking parents through the kindergarten admissions process or the kindergarten IEP process. So if you wouldn't be able to make it to one of those dates, you can find uh, that specific webinar in English and Spanish uh, readily available on our uh, YouTube channel. So it's a great resource. All right, so today we will we walk we a brief overview of what our workshop will entail is how to apply and anything that's uh, new, the type of programs, uh, learning about schools, and then at the end of this we'll have a Q and A and also if there's a question, uh, go right ahead and uh, uh, fill up, send it over to our Q and A. There we go. Okay, so some important dates to remember. So beginning the week of January 10th, applications will open for middle school uh, and need to be in by the week of February 28th. Offers will be given early May, and then for high school, the application will open January 24th and need to be in by the 28th. However, offers will be handed out or offers will be given at the end of May. So middle school, it's the beginning of May, high school, it's the end of May. And in terms of the specialized high school standard admissions test, also known as the SHSAT, um, you would have already taken that, um, taken that in December, and then you will find out in the spring if you have received an offer. This is also my dog <laughs> that's making it in. Um, and then in terms of charter schools, you would have had to, uh, you would need to apply by the 1st of April. Okay, so in regards to the process, like I, men like I just mentioned, um, offers will be given in May. Um, your child's offer letter will include information about any programs where they have also been waitlisted. They're automatically on the waitlist for any programs listed higher on your child's application. Uh, for example, if your child got an offer to their third choice program, they would automatically be on the waitlist for their first and second choice program. However, if your child got into their first choice program, they would not be on any waitlist. However, there is an option through my schools where you can add your child to, um, add or remove your child to any waitlist. Uh, just keep in mind, um, you can join a waitlist, but you might be at the bottom of it. All right. So some of you who aren't familiar, or this might just serve as a refresher, my school is the new database the Department of Education is now using. Back when I was applying to middle school and high schools, I was given a big chunky book that I would, I'd have to flip through and look for, uh, if I was interested in a specific school, I'd have to flip through the book and read through all that information. What's so great about this database is that it makes all of that information readily accessible. Um, you would have had, you would have been given a creation code either uh, through your uh, student's teacher or guidance counselor. Um, and then uh, through that creation code, you would have uh, been able to create your account. But all New York City families can use my schools. All right, so in terms of what's new this year, so there will be no academic screening for middle schools. Waitlist is based on a lottery, uh, lottery uh, process. Um, no district preferences for high schools, but some high schools might have uh, borough slash zone preferences. That's why uh, please consider uh, looking at, if there's a specific high school that's of interest to you, going on their website and um, looking at, well, going to their website, signing up for open houses or going onto my schools and seeing their admissions priorities if they do have any. Um, in regards to screen schools, screens high schools, uh, they can't look at attendance and lateness and will use fall 2020 grades and work samples from last year. All right, so some things to think about. So like I just mentioned, that big chunky book that I was given back in my day is now a virtual PDF, which you can go and um, download and keep on your, um, on any device. So, so, so some things to think about are seats in demand. Uh, you wanna look at uh, how many seats are available. Depend oh, you wanna see how many people are actually applying and how many seats they have available. So if a school has six seats per 30 applicants, that's something you wanna take into account to consider your like the likelihood of your child getting into that school. Uh, priority groups, like I mentioned before, if there is a specific school, make sure to sign up for those open houses or make sure to, uh, uh, check on my schools to see if any updates. Um, again, no appeals, no round two this year, but there is going to be a wait list by lottery number. And again, check out the submissions guide if there is anything that you are um, still curious about.
And one thing to add that I forgot to mention in the beginning, you can see admissions guide is underlined here. Everyone who came, everyone who registered for this training uh, will get a copy of this PowerPoint. And these things include hyperlinks. So you can click on that and it will open up the admissions guide. I forgot to mention that in the beginning. So usually if someone hasn't already asked in the Q&A, yes, we will be sending you a copy of the PowerPoint. So don't worry. All right. So if you or your student are interested in more information, there is a lot of up-to-date information on the Department of Education's website. This is a great resource that includes videos that explain the middle and high school admissions process. Also, uh, you can sign up for one of the DOE's virtual info sessions, um, but, and, and you would find all that information by going to the enrollment tab, enrollment by grade. Um, so yeah, it's a great resource to use during this time. All right, now we're gonna get into the middle school application process. So in terms of middle school admissions, like I mentioned before, in terms of those uh, priority groups, there's the zone, the district, the borough, and the citywide schools. Um, in the past, many middle schools would rank students based on their prior school performances. Oh, I jumped ahead, my bad. So middle schools, um, no, you should go back, I'll, I'll get to that. Oh, thank you. Many middle school students in New York City attend their zone schools. Um, during the application per a period, you can log into my school and see if uh, what your local zone school is. Um, another thing I wanted to mention in terms of citywide schools, for example, a middle school like PPAS, uh, citywide means it's open to any New York City student. For a middle school like a PPAS Performing Arts Middle School, um, the admissions criteria is more so just audition based. Um, but again, uh, zone, you're guaranteed a spot or priority. District is only open to students in that district. And borough means that it's open to students within that borough. All right, now we can go to the next one. All right, so regarding middle school admissions, uh, again, middle schools cannot consider a student's grades, state test scores, or attendance. In terms of location, middle schools can prioritize students in their zone, district, or borough. Uh, schools can also prioritize low-income students, multilingual learners, and students in temporary housing. And again, there are no appeals. However, students with more applicants, or schools, I should say, with more applicants than seats will admit students by lottery in each priority group. Okay. All right, any questions? Okay, it looks like we can keep going. Um, so for high school, uh, the admissions methods, there's a few different kinds. So it's a little bit more complicated than middle school right now. Um, there's specialized schools. That's, uh, Karen talked about that in the beginning. That's where you would have already taken the Shazat. Uh, test and offers are based on a score. That's still true for them. And those are the um, eight, it is eight, right? Specialized schools. If you get an offer to one of those schools, you can also get an offer to a New York City public school and choose which one you want. Um, screened or audition schools. Um, and this is what we'll spend some time talking about at the end of this, like how that screening works and how to figure it out. Um, the best way to look at it uh, right now is to look at the criteria on the website and we'll go through that in more detail later. Um, and then also looking, they can look at the first semester grades from this year. Um, I did when I was digging around on some schools' websites, find one school that seemed to be looking at um, seventh grade uh, first semester grades, which I think the idea is they didn't really want to look at last year's grades. Traditionally, seventh year uh, seventh grade grades would be what people would look at, but that seems pretty unfair when seventh grade was remote and there was a huge difference in terms of how kids did, and it really might not be a fair reflection of what their uh, capabilities are. Um, so they also can look at projects and essays. I think it's a little bit different this year in general. Um, EdOpt is another kind of school where it's kind of a mixture of a school that will just take kids by lottery and as well as they'll do some screening and ranked. So it's a mix of uh, seats. Um, there's also screen language schools. Those are for multilingual learners. They look at how much time you've been in the country, your language proficiency, et cetera. 
Um, there's transfer schools. Uh, that's probably less relevant to you now if you're looking at trying to apply to high school. But for any of you who may have older students who have had a hard time, I think transfer schools are something that you should definitely look at. Um, they have different ways of accelerating credits um, and different ways of basically helping students that were having a hard time in a traditional school. Uh, zoned and open schools, this is something that went back and forth this fall. At first they said there are going to be no zones, no borough-based preference. And then there was a lot of uproar um, from parents who actually, I think, liked having, uh, there was a lot of um, loyalty to some of the borough and zone schools. Um, and so they reinstated it. Uh, and so if you live in a zone school area, you can just apply. Um, and so keep that in mind. Um, oh, and so basically that's the thing that went back and forth if you were following uh, the news and wonder or hearing different things from guidance counselors. Um, they, there is borough and zone preference still, but there's no district preference. Um, and that was true last year too. They eliminated district preference. Okay, and this is true actually for middle or high school. You can apply to charter schools. That's a separate process outside of the DOE. You go to the charter school website and you have to apply by April 1st. Just like the specialized schools, if you get an offer to a charter school, you can compare that with the offer you get from the New York City Public Schools and decide which one you want. Um, Okay, so learning about a school, it takes a lot of research um, to figure out what's right. And it can certainly feel overwhelming with over 400 schools to choose from uh, for both middle school and 400 more for high school, if not more actually. Um, so obviously some of the things that uh, I'm sure you know of and your child has probably already talked to you about, uh, things like sports and clubs or languages if they want to take something. Graduation rate is something to look at. Size and location. Some students really want a very, if they went to a small middle school, they want a bigger school with lots of options. Some students feel exactly the opposite. This is one where the most important thing is to find the right fit for your child. Um, the admissions method. You, Karen, had talked talked about this a little bit and we'll talk about it further. But if it's a screen school, which a lot of schools that are particularly sought after in New York fall in this screen category, um, you want to look and see like, well, what are my odds of getting in there? Um, CTE and job training. That's something that um, certainly I would be careful of. Some schools might say that, you know, they're the school for business or for sports or for whatever. Make sure that, you know, they really are. Sometimes that's something in a name, but other schools, it, it is more than a name. So I think doing your research, looking these schools up on Inside Schools, on the DOE website, talking to other families and trying to find things out. Um, accessibility, we'll go through that uh, if your child or you uh, uses a wheelchair or a walker and accessibility to a school is important. It's certainly something to research because as you may already know, um, many New York City public schools are not accessible. Okay, so looking up, I think I talked about this a little bit, but looking up a school on my schools. Um, so you'd see this, this page if you were looking up just, okay, let me look up high schools. I've heard of Thurgood Marshall and you're looking here and you can see their overview, but you don't see much else here. You see how big they are. That's obviously important. Um, and where they're located, the school hours, obviously that can change, but it will give you a sense of what they did. Um, then the place to really look in terms of, well, how competitive is it? What kind of school is this? Is that little star on the bottom? Um, so I don't know that this is always so intuitive for parents, but uh, some schools actually have multiple programs listed. This school just has one. Um, and this is, I think this is from that school. It might be old, so don't take this as, oh, this is what Thurgood Marshall's admissions are, but it's an example of what it looks like. You can see on here that uh, there's five applicants per seat for gen ed and six applicants for seats for students with disabilities. That's a little unusual. I would say the majority of schools, it's flipped. There's more applicants for seats in gen ed than for students with disabilities, but it's important to look at. The more applicants per seat, there are, the more competitive a school is. So, you know, if you see a school that's 30 applicants per seat, keep in mind that's going to be a really tough school to get into. Um, and, you know, just to look at this, you can also see are their priorities. Thurgood Marshall was a 6 to 12 school. So students that were uh, in, in that school in middle school have priority for high school. Um, then it's Manhattan students or residents, and then New York City residents is their um, admissions. 
Um, so screening methods. This is how we're going to go through a whole bunch of different ways in which schools screen. And this is about how they screen uh, your student, not how your student screens them. Um, so screen schools criteria. Uh, this has changed a lot. Probably one of the biggest changes in uh, the past few years is how much screening screen schools can do. Um, and uh, so in the past, they used to have, sometimes you would see like a number cutoff, like you need a three or four on the state tests or 85 and above on uh, grades. Last year, I think because of COVID and remote learning, they did something where it was more, look, we're going to look at these factors and this is how we weigh things. So um, we're not going to really pay much attention to ELA and math scores. It's only 20%, but we are looking at final grades and marking periods. This year, unfortunately, and I have to admit, I did not check right before this training, I meant to, um, but there's no information up in any school that Karen and I could see, and we were digging around on the My Schools website. It just says more information will be available soon. Um, I'm sure it will be available before you have to submit your application, but if you're looking at a screen school, that's a really important criteria to know. Um, and so a tip that we had that in many of the schools that I knew to be pretty competitive, I started looking them up and I looked on their school websites, uh, not the schools.nyc.gov website, but I just Googled the name of a school and uh, found their website because most schools have their own websites and looked under admissions. Uh, and I could see some schools were very specific. One school said, look, we rank students in these different uh, groups. So if you want to be in group one, which is how we admit students, you need 85 or above on your grades uh, from the fall of 2020. One school was talking about, we're looking at your grades from seventh grade fall. Uh, so just, you have to look school by school. Um, also schools have open houses recorded. If you missed it, which you know at this point in the year, you probably did. Um, I would definitely encourage you to go look at an open house video. You can often get a sense of at least what the administration of a school is like and see what you think of it as whether or not it would be a good fit. Um, Audition schools. There's no dates yet for audition schools. Um, and one thing that they're saying right now is for every audition school, there's I think 25 of them, you are able to apply uh, to audition virtually. Um, so you don't have to go in person. Um, and they do, some schools have in-person options. I don't know if that's going to change um, given the shifting situation with the pandemic. And that's exactly the kind of thing that I would just keep checking back on a school's website if you're interested in it. Keep looking at the DOE website um, and see what shifted. The one thing they did say is assuming there's in-person and virtual auditions available, um, they have to count those equally. So you should not get, you know, a leg up if you went to an in-person audition. Virtual auditions and in-person auditions have to be counted the same. I think they wanted to make sure that they weren't penalizing a student who didn't feel comfortable going in um, or wasn't able to go in. Uh, okay, so screened language. We talked about this before, but this is based on your English proficiency or a specific language spoken at home. Um, and these can be great schools for students, especially, you know, for students that are older and newer to the country, it can be really important to get that support. Uh, Continuing students. I think this was my example of Thurgood Marshall, but if your child is in a K to 8 or 6 to 12 school, they have preference for that next grade. So for example, my son went to a K to 8 school. I thought about applying to middle school. Many of his friends did apply to a different middle school. They wanted a bigger school, a different school, whatever. For us, I decided most of all what I wanted was to avoid the whole application process. And so I knew he could just stay. I filled out an application that listed the school he was at and he stayed K through eight. Um, if you're in a school that's six to 12, the same thing is true for applying to high school. You absolutely have a right to it, um, even if there aren't, you know, the seats are very limited. Zoned and geographic, um, I know I mentioned this earlier, but that's something that went back and forth this fall. Are they doing it? Or are they not doing it? There aren't too many of those. Um, they're mostly in Brooklyn and Queens, but if it applies to you, you know, you, you would see it on a school in terms of their priority groups, um, who they were, you know, prioritizing. Uh, 
Okay, so specialized programs. Um, these are programs that are outside of the application process. So to get into them, uh, you have to, it depends on which program I'm talking about, but it's separate from just applying. Um, so for a bilingual ICT or special class, there's a, a specialized programs office at the DOE that you could apply to, that you could talk to. Hopefully your school would be able to help you with this, um, but those, run in a different way and they're really limited. So um, it's important to, you know, make sure you know where they are. But for many students, if you need a, if your student needs a bilingual special class, um, you know, you would definitely want to investigate, well, which ones are available in, you know, that I could travel to and see if they would work for you. Um, ASD Nest and Horizon, these are programs for students on the spectrum. They're inclusion programs in district one through 32 schools. Um, and they have different uh, application procedures. You would apply in a different way. ASD Nest uh, is integrated and is more of like a Regents track program. Horizon tends to be students that need a little bit more help and it's not as integrated. Um, ASD Nest is more like all specialized ICT and Horizon is self-contained classes, so smaller classes. Um, and although these expanded significantly in the past few years, I think there's still more demand than there are seats. Um, so certainly it's worth exploring early and trying to see if this would be a good fit for your child. Um, ACES is a relatively new program. It's for students with intellectual disabilities and it's a self-contained meaning all students with disabilities and in this case in all of the cases of these specialized programs it's a super specialized program so that it's not just a small class it's a small class where everyone has a similar disability um, and uh, these are included in a D1 through 32 schools so it's not district 75 um, and then barrier-free accessible schools. This is its own thing because if you need a barrier-free school, um, there was a change a couple of years ago to make sure that students who need barrier-free schools do have priority in the admissions process so that they can get in because you know not enough schools are accessible. If you need to find a school that is accessible, uh, you can look it up. I was so excited to see this year that something called the BAP scores or the Building Accessibility Profile scores are linked there you can see them right on the my schools page um, so you can find out i would caution you that if a school says even if it says fully accessible um, but especially if it says partially accessible do your research dig into those reports and go visit and see if it really works um, this is a picture of the kid on the uh, right is my son actually and that was our first high school tour to a fully accessible school where the bathrooms in the school did not work for him uh, apparently there would have been something they could have done but it's really really important to do your research as in he couldn't get in the door like it wasn't a complicated accessible he couldn't enter the bathroom so I was like mm, that's not going to work um, so it's something that you know you definitely want to do your research that's true for anybody in this you know for high schools um, another thing to keep in mind is that there is a diversity and in admissions initiative that was started a few years ago not all schools participate in it but schools that do if you fit one of these criteria where you get free or reduced price lunch um, everyone is entitled to free lunch but this is about your income uh, students who are learning English, students in temporary housing. Um, if you fall into any of those categories, you should certainly look because a lot of schools hold seats. Um, and so you might have a much easier time getting into a certain school. And it's important to know what your chances are when you're trying to decide what to do. Okay, um, so we can pause here for questions. Liana, how are we doing? Whoops. Oh, one question just came in as you asked what we had going on. Um, my son is on the autism spectrum. He is 10 years old and he also applied for the ACES school program. That's a really good question. And I, I mean, I would say, well, here's the easiest answer. The specialized programs at schools.nyc.gov, if you look it up, it uh, does all go to the same centralized office. Um, so I would say, yes, you should definitely write to them and say you're interested in ACEs. Um, if you're also interested in ASD Horizon, 
or um, ASD Nest, that's something else that you could look at. I'm assuming ASD Horizon might be more what you're talking about if you're also thinking ACEs. Um, ACEs has a criteria that I don't entirely understand. Um, so we've had students where they've said, no, they're scores are too high or too low or you know and so it's i'm not entirely sure i understand it but i think it cannot hurt to explore it and to look at it because the worst that can happen is they say no or they say yes and you go and look at it and you think no but i'm a big believer in explore all your options because um, this is obviously a really important decision to make um, so hopefully that helps you can look the description up online um, on the website but uh, i found in my own experience of trying to help students get in, it's a little bit less clear to me who who gets in, and it, it may just depend on the you know what kind of cohort is in each school uh, for that program. Okay, this is another question we get a lot of: uh, seats for students with IEPs. Um, so. Uh, there is a set aside for students with IEPs, that thing that I was showing you in the beginning where uh, six students per seat for um, Thurgood Marshall for students with disabilities and five students per seat for general education students. But I, I need to change that example for next year because the norm is the reverse where you know maybe there's 20 students per seat for gen ed, but 10 for students with disabilities. So for most, most schools or many schools that were especially especially the screen schools and the more competitive screen schools, they need to bump up the number of students with disabilities they take. And central DOE has pushed them to not just take the kids with the top scores, but to make sure that they're taking a more diverse group. And so they were looking at making sure that they're taking more students with disabilities. Um, because the history of this is that students with disabilities were often cut out of the um, screen schools um, and certainly are still pretty much cut out of the specialized schools uh, for the most part. Um, but one question that comes up is this language gets kind of confusing and it is a term of art, the SWD, um, which bothers me because it actually that stands for students with disabilities. But obviously a student with a disability may or may not have an IEP. Many do, but not all. And then actually even more confusingly, you can have an IEP but not qualify for the student with disability set aside. This is reading the footnotes, but every year on our helpline, we get a call from parents who say, I don't understand why my son was not or child, you know, a daughter was not considered a student with a disability. We have to explain the actual wording of this set aside is that it's more than 20% of that student's classes are in special education. So that would be, um, it could be sets, ICT, small class, lunch doesn't count. And so that's who equals a student with disability. So how this would work, for example, if there's 35 classes per week in a school, less than 20% could be you just get related services or you get the most typical sets uh, you know, recommendation, which is five times a week. More than 20% would be ICT for all classes, small class for all classes, or 10 periods of sets. Um, so it's important to know that that's what they're looking at when they say students with disabilities. Now, if you, you know, if you're looking at Thurgood Marshall, another school where the seats were pretty similar, that may not matter. But for many schools where there's a discrepancy between students in gen ed and students uh, with disabilities by this really specific um, terminology is something that it's important to know. Um, okay, uh, so in this is another question we get a lot of, well, can I apply anywhere? Do they have to take me? Um, can they screen me out because they see my child has an I, or can they screen my child out because they see his or her IEP? Um, no, they absolutely don't see the IEP uh, until your child gets into the school. Students with IEPs apply in the same way as other students for District 1 through 32 schools. District 75 is its own thing. Um, but the new school must implement the IEP and any change that they make has to be based on the student's needs and not the school's program. So you absolutely have a right to have your child's IEP implemented but reality can be complicated. So I feel like 
that's your legal right and you should know that. You should also know what you're signing up for if you're going to a school that does not have any small classes and you want your child to have a small class, um, which could be a fight, right? It's something that you probably wanna talk about um, rather than have this fight with your child's first year in middle school or high school. Uh, so I'm not saying you shouldn't have that fight. That fight can be really worth fighting, um, but I do think it's important to keep your eyes open and know what you're, what's, what could happen. Um, so that brings me to the next really common question that I wish there was an easier way to answer it, but how do you know if a school has a small class or ICT? You can ask, of course, um, and some schools are really honest and tell you right up front, oh yeah, we have small classes, but only in ELA. We don't have them in science or math, or we have an ICT in all grades. Some schools give you this vague, we serve all students' needs, so we'll figure out how to serve your child's needs when they come here. Um, which sounds nice, but it, you know sometimes it's disturbing. And I think it's really good to get a sense of, does this a school that has any experience with students with disabilities? Um, I think more and more schools do. I do think the DOE's efforts to integrate schools have generally been, uh, they've made a lot of progress, but there's still a lot more room to grow is maybe what it, the easiest way to say it. So to find out the history of a school as, uh, inclusion of students with disabilities, you can go to the DOE website, go to school quality reports, go to the school quality guide. It's not that there's something called like the snapshot or the short one, you need the long one. And then you'll get to something where you'll see students with disabilities uh, as a, you know, one of the groups and there's a little plus sign next to that. If you click on the plus sign, you can see, so for this school, they don't have any kids in self-contained settings or they have less than five, which means they don't really have them. Most of their students are in ICT. It also looks like they don't have a lot of sets. Now, I'm not saying that sets in ICT couldn't be given in a different way. Some students who get sets might do fine in an ICT and vice versa, but it's important to know Okay, they, they do have, this school has decided to meet its students with disabilities needs by providing ICT. If that can work for your child, or if you have more questions based on that, that's fine. But I think it's important to know if your child has a small class and this is your school that you really want your child to go to, you know, you have to figure out, are they really going to be able to create a small class? How's that going to work? Um, another place to look is class size reports. Um, and uh, you can click on detailed level school data and that will show you, you know, by subject. This is super detailed stuff, um, but it can be really helpful if you're digging into a school and want to understand. Um, so here you can see what classes they have in ICT, what classes they have in self-contained. So this is a school with a lot of different classes um, that are optional. We, it, the top part got cut off, but it's about how many class, so the, you know, the different columns you can see on top are how many students total, how many sections, average size, um, smallest and largest. Uh, so it's just a way to explore what kind of classes do they have. Um, uh, lastly, so some tips for applying, because I know this is a lot uh, to do. Certainly only apply to programs you'd be happy to attend. My least favorite calls that break my heart every spring are from parents who say, but they told me I had to apply to 12 schools and the guidance counselor just listed some schools as a safety. And they had never seen or heard of that school. And of course, you know, what school did they get? They got number 12 and it was not a school they wanted. It is much harder to get out of that. Um, conversely, don't just list three schools or the worst, the other calls I hate are where like, well, I listed Beacon six times and they have to give me Beacon, right? No, they don't. I don't even think online you can do that. Um, but, you know, you want to list as many schools as you can and make sure every single one of those is a school that you would feel comfortable sending your child to. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Uh, rank your true preferences. So the schools do not see your preference. Uh, so make sure that it's a school you want and that you're listing them in the order you really want them to be. 
Make your last pick a safe school, meaning that it's one that you would like, but it's the least hard to get into. I think that's the one thing that I always feel a little bad about saying rank your true preferences. If your top preference is a super, or your middle preference is a super competitive school, but you think you almost don't have a chance of getting in there, I don't know. It's hard to say which way you should put that because a lot of the super competitive schools tend to only take the students who rank them first. Every year, the DOE will say that they don't see that. They might not see how you rank. They don't see how you rank them. But if it's a match or these are the students the school wants, these are the schools the student wants, how that lines up can get kind of complicated. But the one thing that's clear is you definitely want to put some schools on there that you would feel comfortable going to, but that you know if you're listing all very competitive schools, for the most part in the top, make sure there's some less competitive schools that you feel comfortable with. Um, and it really is important not to get too swayed by that, oh, this is a good school. Um, because the schools that are the most competitive or sought after, if they're not a good fit for your child, they're not going to be happy. Um, and so it's really important to make sure it's the right fit uh, and that it's an environment that your child will feel supported in. Um, also, the last thing, looking to schools with multiple programs. So if you really like a school, but they have multiple programs, like I think art and design is one, for example, it's a big high school, lots of different programs, you can list each, you can list photography. And, uh, oh my goodness, I don't even know what else they have art, uh, sculpture or something. Um, uh, my son was not into art, so that was not a school we listed, but putting the, you know, you can list each one of those programs. Um, and that doesn't count as applying to a school more than once. It's just each program counts as an application spot. Um, okay. Finally, language access rights and translation and interpretation. Uh, this is something that the DOE uh, thankfully just allocated a lot more money to because wow, is it an area for them to improve in. Um, these are the top languages that are spoken. They have to translate uh, any forms in those languages and they should provide you with an interpreter, a professional interpreter. Um, far too often we see them you know, just pulling some teacher or social worker out who speaks the language of the parent, or even worse, asking a, another member of the family to come in and translate, to interpret. Um, so make sure that you're asking for this. Um, you can call that number on the bottom if you're having trouble getting translation and interpretation services, or there's an email as well. Um, okay, so finally, I'm gonna try to put in the chat a um, Google survey that would be wonderful. And we're gonna launch some, if you can do, and we're gonna launch some polls as well. Um, but if there's any questions that we need to answer, Liliana, if you could let us know, that'd be great. If people have any questions, please let us know. There are no open questions at this point. Okay. Okay, so here, I think, yeah, I just put in the chat um, all to everybody, the Google form. Whoops, sorry about that. Uh, so let me launch the polls. Um, oh, wow. Okay, sorry, hold on. Okay, so if you could answer these, they really do help us. In the Google form, there's actually more information as well, um, including what was helpful. And also if there's other trainings you would like, please let us know. We actually do respond and we'll try to create whatever we can to help parents navigate this unfortunately pretty complicated process. Okay, well, we can hang around for another minute or so and see if there's other questions. Uh, this has been a quiet group, um, but I think we're all juggling a lot of uncertainty uh, and probably people are thinking I'm gonna do my applications later. Um, so congratulations to all of you who made it out today. Uh, I know that there's a lot going on right now. Um, hope you all have safe, healthy, holiday break. 
Uh, and certainly if there's anything that we can help you with as you're going through this or questions that you have, please reach out to our helpline, email us through the website. Um, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, if you found this helpful, uh, please share. You will get, it takes a couple days for us to get the recording up, but we'll send around the recording of this. Please feel free to share it with other parents. Um, so thank you so much. Okay. Take care. Question. There's a question. Oh, there's a question. There, okay. <laughs> yes. Are there comprehensive lists of District 75 schools or the specialized schools? Uh, so the specialized schools, um, I guess it depends on what you mean by that, but the specialized schools like, I'm assuming you mean, you know, the NEST schools or the bilingual schools. We did actually just recently get a list um, of middle school and high schools with self-contained bilingual programs um, that I'm happy to share. It's not something that we have up. Um, and I have district, the District 75 part of the DOE website does have some listings by schools. It is still pretty tough to navigate. Um, and how the District 75 process works is it's still through a placement officer. Um, but I have heard that many parents who have specific programs that they're interested in are able to try to advocate for them early. Um, okay, and here's another question about a middle school that has specialty programs and interested in becoming a vet. I am not aware of that. Certainly, you know, you could search one good thing about it being online. It doesn't work for a lot of families we work with, but uh, the my school's thing being online is you might be able to search by vet um, and see. Uh, but I'm not really sure. What I would say too is keep in mind that a summer internship um, or something like that might also be a great way to explore career options. Um, and when you get into high school, um, and maybe they even have stuff for middle school, but the transition centers, um, the acronym is TCAC, T-C-A-C. Uh, Liliana, help me out. Do you remember what it stands for? Transition center. I'm you terrible. Hold on, hold on. I, <laughs> Google I, is you friend. just you just blocked my mind. I'm sorry. It will come to me in just a minute. I think anyway, I need to write the TCOC centers, which is what everyone calls them anyway. If you actually said the whole name, people might not know what you're talking about. There's one in each borough, and they can uh, be great. Okay, that's a really good question that just came in. My son is going to high school. His IEP says 12 to one plus one. Now, the lawyer in me wants to tell you 12 to 1 plus 1 is on the state required continuum, so it should be in high school. However, I would say if you asked people at the DOE, 90% of them or more would say they don't do that in high school. It's 15 to 1, which is not actually accurate. But then I think stepping back, maybe rather than just the ratio, thinking about, well, what does your son need? You know, why does he need the small class? Could he have a 15 to one? Uh, does he need a para in a 15 to one? Um, so trying to figure out what your child needs and then match it with what the high school has um, is probably a better way to go. Uh, what should happen is at the end of this year, so in the spring, um, you really want to be talking to the school that you've applied to when you find out, let's say you find out in May, and you're going to that school, and they do have small classes, but they're 15 to one, and you think your child needs more help. Um, you would want to try to see now this is it should not be such a, you know, radical concept, but if it's at all possible, get somebody from the high school to join the eighth grade IEP meeting. That's what I was able to do for my son, where he had a very tricky transition from middle school to high school, and it made a big difference, um, even if they can just call in. Um, if that can't happen, at least talking to the high school about what they have and what the IEP should say, and talking to the eighth grade team about that last IEP. I have found in my experience that especially for school, creating an IEP that they're not going to be responsible for implementing, they might be really open to helping you out and putting specific things on the IEP. Um, hopefully that makes sense. There's one more question. Um, Sherry asks if a child can get a para in middle school. Yes. I mean, absolutely. Paras right now 
are really hard. I wish that was not true, but they it, we have had on our helpline this year, the number one complaint coming in, or I guess number one, two or three, whatever has been busing, busing paras followed up by paras. And I think that's because there's a huge shortage in paras. Um, I think the DOE has hired an incredible number of paras. I think they hired just, they think they replaced almost 25% of their para force this year. Um, so a lot of people quit. Uh, didn't return. Um, and, you know, for anybody, my son has had a para his whole time in school, it's really hard to find the right person and to get the right fit. Um, but absolutely, sometimes schools say, oh, they don't do that in middle school. Um, this is a different training, but my one big tip from the special ed 101 training is don't forget what the I stands for in IEP. And that's individual. It's an individualized program. So anytime somebody says they don't do paras in middle school, that's not very individualized sounding. That's not right. They do do paras in middle school. Anything your child needs, they should be able to create. That school may not know how to get the resources for it, but somebody up the chain at the DOE should be able to help you figure that out. Um, so that's obviously not correct. I would try to get uh, those concerns written in the IEP. There's a section called parent concerns. You say, well, I want that reflected in the IEP if you're saying you don't allow paras in middle school. And I want it reflected that I want a para. Um, you know, if you can get that written into an IEP or push back with them, go up the chain, um, you know, going to the superintendent, writing to special education at schools.nyc.gov. Um, hopefully that's the kind of thing that can work out. If you're not able to resolve it on your own and you have, you know, good proof that you need one. Because the other thing is, do you have an evaluation that shows your child needs a para? Um, then that's something that you can write into us and we can see if we can help. Okay. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, any other questions that I missed, Liana? I'm unmuting, there you go. Uh, none that are coming in. Um, I, think, I think this is it. I think everyone should have a wonderful break. Uh, remember, we have information on our YouTube page for other webinars, for us, including special education, um, and more. And go to our website and look for additional supports um, and information. We have many documents available in multiple languages. Um, I especially like the IEP worksheet. Um, if you can find that on our special education webpage, it would be really helpful for your next IEP meeting. Um, and I wish you luck. Okay, thanks everyone. Good luck with the process.